Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to do something a tiny bit different on my channel. First of all, the cat just woke up and he's drinking water. He's probably going to eat in a second, but whatever. Tonight I'm going to show you one of my uh, tutoring teaching tricks. I found this book at my used bookstore. It is an actual California history textbook from what I assume would be like probably sixth grade, which is about age 11 or 12 in California, where you just learn about ancient history. It's, it's very interesting how California set up uh, the history programs. I don't think it's changed from when I was little. Fourth grade is California history. Fifth grade is like early American history up to the Civil War. Sixth grade is ancient history. And then seventh grade is like medieval times and stuff like that. And then eighth grade is like more modern history. But anyway, so sixth grade was this topic. So I assume that's what this book is for. So this book was kindly donated. I blacked out her last name by Martha from Oakland. Thank you. And then right after I got this book, I accidentally water damaged it. It's kind of a happy accident because now it's really crinkly. But, um, it was totally an accident, I swear. So this is the study method I would use for tutoring like high school and under. And, um, there we go. It's perfect for if it's material that they're just learning and don't quite understand, or if they're studying for a test, if it's test prep, we call it. So um, this is the method I use. So we'll start with chapter one of this book. Lesson one is the distant past, which is pretty cool because that's come up a lot on my channel recently. All right, I think my cat's done being a nuisance now. Anyway. Where was I? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so this topic's come up a lot on my channel recently, very interestingly. So this should be a little refresher for some of you that have been watching my videos recently. Also, I haven't rehearsed this video. This is, I'm just going in kind of blind. I kind of glanced through this book. Um, so we'll see what we do. So the first thing we do is we look at this box of vocabulary words. And we go through each word, make sure we know what each word means. So when we come across it in the text, we don't have to stop and think about what it is. So let's get our notes out. I'm very old fashioned. I grew up in the nineties where we took notes with pen and paper and that's how I still do it today. So you always title it um, with what you're doing. So let's say this is um, test prep, test prep. I hope you can see. Um, lesson one, the distant past. We're going to start off with our vocab words. We write them down even if we already know what they mean. The first word is anthropology. So I ask, do you know what anthropology means? A-N-T-H-R-O. L-O-G-Y, and throw, of course, an ology means study of, right? So anthropology is the study of how people used to live long, long time ago, mostly before there was written language. So an anthropologist has to look at different things from the past and try to figure out how that was used and how people lived with those things in the past. Our next word is archaeologist. 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 A-R-C-H-A-E-O-L-O-G-I-S-T. You can tell by the ist at the end. You can tell I did spelling that this is a person's job, most likely, or a profession. And an archeologist would be a person who goes to find things that are from the past. 
they would dig around to maybe find something like dinosaur bones or old pots from old cultures. They would be the ones in the dirt digging around trying to find them. And of course, they are really knowledgeable about being careful and not damaging things and being very respectful of all the things they find. Do you understand the difference between an anthropologist and an archaeologist? It's more like an archaeologist finds the things and an anthropologist studies the things that archaeologists find. Our next word is prehistory. I'm sure you know what the word history means, but prehistory. Pre means before. So before history. So if anything is prehistory, that means it was history that happened before there was writing, before we knew exactly what was happening in history. So if something's from prehistory, we kind of have to make guesses about what really happened. Next word is fossil. I'm sure you've heard that word before. F-O-S-S-S-S-I-L, fossil. A fossil is a bone that you find in the ground from maybe a dinosaur or an old person. A fossil could also be a plant or even like a stone, like amber could be a fossil. Amber is um, tree sap that's been fossilized, so you can study that because if something's a fossil that means it's been in the ground for a long long time and um, still is in good shape you know you can kind of study it so an archaeologist would find a fossil and give that fossil to an anthropologist to study our next word is geologist geologist you can see the ist again. That means it's a person that studies something. A geologist is a person that studies rocks and stones. Isn't that interesting? A whole a person whose just job is to look at rocks, right? And you might think, well, why would a rock scientist need to study history? Well, a geologist could be very helpful to archaeologists and anthropologists. They could look at old stones and figure out how old they are or where they came from. There's been some instances where stones have been traded across different peoples and they'll find a stone in a place that doesn't come from that area. So a geologist can help figure out where that stone came from. It would help us learn more about prehistory. Our next word is artifact. Artifact. Do you see any words in there? You already know. I see two. I see art, A-R-T, and I see fact, F-A-C-T. An artifact is a, a kind of thing you would find in the ground that usually would be something that's made by a person from prehistory that is still well preserved enough that um, an anthropologist can study it and learn more about it. Artifacts is mostly what archaeologists are looking for along with fossils. So do you see the difference between a fossil and an artifact? A fossil would be like a bone or even like a dead insect could be fossilized. Um, wood can be fossilized, rocks can be fossilized, but an artifact is something that a person made with their own hands. Like it could be a statue, it could be um, like old art, it could be anything like that that they would find. Our next word is hunter-gatherer. Hunter-gatherer. A hunter-gatherer. Now what do you think just on that? It could be, you know what a hunter is? Someone who hunts. So a gatherer would be someone who gathers. So back before there were supermarkets, people had to get food somehow. So they would hunt for it. They would hunt animals and they would gather it. They'd gather like berries or mushrooms or anything like that. 
So when we're talking about hunter-gatherers, those are mostly people who lived on this planet before there were markets or any kind of civilization where they could get food or, you know, from a farm or anything like that. They had to hunt for it and gather for it. So that's a hunter-gatherer. Our next word is culture, and that's a very important word. Culture, C-U-L-T-U-R-E culture. Culture is um, kind of hard to describe actually. It's really how a group of people would live. Your culture can be what kind of food you eat, what kind of clothes you wear, how you speak, how you live your life. It can even be how you hunt or gather. It could be how you get married, how you, how like babies are born, how people are buried. It can be a whole bunch of different things. So one group's culture could be totally different from another group's culture, right? So it's, it's very hard to describe what culture is. It'll be interesting to see what it says in the book. There's two more words. They're academic words, it says. The first one is evidence. So evidence is, um, that's a good word, actually. So let's say that um, your little brother knocked over a lamp and it broke, right? What do you have to do? You have to either hide it or tattle. So let's say you're going to tattle, right? You're going to say, um, little Johnny broke the lamp. Well, <clears throat> Johnny went and hid the lamp. How are you going to prove to your parents that Johnny broke the lamp? You're going to have to find some evidence. You can find some broken pieces of glass. Another piece of evidence would be that the lamp is gone. You maybe could see the dust where the lamp was sitting before it was gone to prove that it was still there. So evidence would be things that you would find to help kind of tell a story or explain a mystery. Does that make sense? E-V-I-D-E-N-C-E -E -E, evidence. And then our last word is conclude. Conclude. So when you conclude something is when you look at all the evidence and you make a decision, you make a conclusion about what happened based on the evidence. So you could say, well, that lamp was low to the ground and Johnny is short. So you could conclude that it was Johnny that broke it, right? You could conclude that because the pieces of the lamp were hidden under Johnny's bed, you can say, well, I would conclude that Johnny was the one that broke it because he tried to hide the evidence, right? So that's what these two words mean. Evidence would be looking to find pieces of something to tell a story and then use those pieces to conclude what happened. Be interesting to see how these come up in our chapter, right? So let's start reading. Let's see what our book says. Here we go. So it says, we are all interested in people, but certain people called anthropologists have made a science out of studying people. Anthropology is the study of how human beings behave, how they act together, where they came from, and what makes one group of people different from another. It's a really good definition of anthropology. Remember when we wrote it down? Anthropology, studying of how humans behave and everything that goes along with it. In this lesson, we'll look at the work of a particular group of anthropologists known as archaeologists. Archaeologists study human life in the past by examining the things that people left behind. And we talked about that. Archaeologists are anthropologists that studied people that aren't really around anymore. Or plants or dinosaurs, anything like that. Things that aren't around anymore. So studying early humans. Until about 5,000 years ago, people had no way to write things down. Hmm. To study prehistory, or the time before written records, archaeologists look for the places where people may have lived. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Because obviously people came before writing, right? So, 
archaeologists would have to think where would people have lived to you know figure out how they lived there hmm. very interesting what are fossils do you remember to learn about the earliest humans archaeologists depend mainly on fossils fossils are hardened remains or imprints of living things that existed long ago these remains may include plants feathers bones and even footprints isn't that interesting a footprint could be a fossil if it's old enough right hmm. that's pretty cool and then i always say is this making sense do you have any questions before we turn the page and also if they're a good reader i have them read along and i might ask them questions like um how could a feather be a fossil and then they think hmm, well maybe you know they're studying old birds like oh yeah that's a great idea i like that all right let's read some more fossils form in several ways for example after a living thing dies it may quickly become covered by sand or mud. Once covered, the soft parts of the plant or animal rot away. The harder parts, such as bones, teeth, or woody stems, last much longer. Over many years, minerals from the soil slowly replace this once living material. What remains is a rock-like copy of the original. So if you haven't noticed, I always stop at the end of each paragraph, and I would check on the kid make sure they're still following long make sure they're still getting it so this one might be a little confusing so think about parts of you that are soft and parts of you that are hard right your skin is soft your eyes are soft um what else is soft maybe your hair is soft and then what parts of you are hard your fingernails your bones inside your teeth things like that so this is saying that if you get all covered up by the mud after you die, right? Kind of a scary thing to think about, but whatever. The first things that are going to rot away are your soft parts. That goes for any animal or plant, it says. But the hard parts stick around a lot longer. So, you know, for dinosaurs, that's why we only find their bones, right? Because all the soft parts of them are gone they're in the soil they're they're completely gone all that's left are the hard parts so that's interesting to think about isn't it hmm so archaeologists are looking for things that were once hard not for things that were soft because they're very much gone you might think about things in our life that are hard and soft and if they were buried what would be left behind you know if your backpack were buried what would stay behind? You think all the paper would be gone? Uh, maybe your keychains would stay behind, right? And the zippers on your backpack? Those would, because those are hard. Very interesting to think about, isn't it? So, how were ancient remains dated? Isn't that a good question? How old is something that they find in the ground? Let's find out. Archaeologists use several methods for determining the ages of fossils and other prehistoric objects. In this work, they get valuable information from geologists, scientists who study the physical materials of Earth itself, such as soil and rocks. Remember, scientists who study rocks. One dating method, which means, you know, the date is, you know, like the day, today's date is, so a dating method, how old something is, basically. A way of finding out the date that it came from. One dating method is to compare objects found in similar layers of rock or soil. Objects found in lower layers are generally older than those found in upper layers. Archaeologists may also compare an object with a similar fossil or artifact whose age is already known. So let's think about you know, if you bury something in the ground and then you bury something on top of it, obviously the thing on the bottom is older than the thing on the top. So as they dig, they're finding things that are older and older and older. And they're also saying if they find an object that maybe they found somewhere else and they already know how old that is, they can figure out how old the other thing is. Making sense? Awesome. Let's 
see with this big word. Radioactive dating is another method for determining the age of objects up to about 50,000 years old. That's older than me. <laughs> Living things contain radioactive elements that decay or break down over time. By measuring the radioactive material in bones and other materials that were once alive, scientists can tell when an object was formed. Let's talk about this. Does this make sense? It's kind of a lot of big words in here, isn't it? So radioactive, something that's radioactive has a lot of radiation in it. A lot of things have radiation. The heat from a microwave is radiation. Heat from the sun is another form of radiation. There's lots of different forms of radiation, actually. You know, when you get an x-ray, like at the dentist, when they x-ray your teeth, that's also a form of radiation. So a radiation is a kind of energy. We all have it in us just a tiny bit, right? So um, radiation is something that also can break down once it's buried in the mud, right? The soft things go, and then eventually the radiation goes. But radiation takes a long time to go. So if they find an object that was once alive that had a radiation in it, they can see how much radiation is in it to figure out how old it is. If it has a lot of radiation, then another thing, then that other thing is older, right? So that's radioactive dating figuring out how old something is based on its radiation. Do you want to look this over make sure that that all makes sense now? So, it determines the age of things up to 50,000 years old. Remember, living things contain radioactive elements that decay or break down over time, right? We all have a little bit of radiation elements, a little thing, a little bit of radiation in us. By measuring the radioactive material in bones, because remember, bones are one of the last things to go if you buried in the mud. So they look at the radiation in the bones and other materials that were once alive. You know, maybe your teeth or, you know, who knows, maybe even animal bones. Scientists can tell when an object was formed, how old it is. Does that make a lot more sense? I know it's weird to think about, isn't it? Very strange to think about. Let's go on to the next paragraph. In recent years, scientists have developed other methods to study fossils. They use DNA to compare human remains from the past with people living today. Genetic evidence has uncovered new information about how people changed and how they moved from place to place. It's another weird paragraph, isn't it? Let's go over it. So, DNA, do you know what that is? It's a, it's a kind of a long word. I won't go into it too much, but your DNA is everything that makes you, you. The, your DNA determines what color your eyes are, what color your skin is, how tall you grow, if your hair is curly or straight, what color your hair is, you know, how high or low your voice is. It, everything about you is in your DNA. And everyone has different DNA, too, because everyone looks and talks and acts different, right? So anything that's alive is made of DNA. It's kind of like a code, like a computer code inside your body that tells your body how to look and how to behave as you grow. So it's saying they use DNA because they can find that, too, in your bones to compare human remains from the past with people living today. So remember I said everyone's DNA is different, right? Um, but DNA comes from both of your parents. Your DNA is half of your mother's DNA with half of your father's DNA. So they could look at your DNA and probably figure out who your mother was, right? And they could even figure out who your mother's mother's mother was. And um, they could see the similarities because maybe you have the same eye color as your mother. Maybe your mother's mother's mother had the same eye color. So they can compare DNA from people today to people in the past. And maybe that can help them figure out how old a fossil bone would be, right? Let's see, it says genetic evidence has uncovered. Genetic means 
your DNA, your genes is what it's called. It's not the genes you wear, the genes in your body that make up your DNA. Genetic evidence has uncovered new information about how people changed and how they moved from place to place. So think maybe you find a bone in Asia that you look at the DNA and it matches the DNA of someone from Europe. And it's like, whoa, how is this possible? You can figure out how people probably moved from place to place, how they spread so far apart and how they changed too, right? So whenever there's a question like that, that usually means it's going to come up on a test. And since this is test prep, let's answer this question. Was there a question over here? What are fossils? We know, you got that. How are ancient remains dated? So let's answer that question. Get our notes out. How are ancient remains dated? And as you can tell, you watching this video, I talk very casually, right? It's one of the reasons why in my country series I talk so casually, because I feel like you learn so much better when you explain it matter-of-factly, right? It, it just, you retain it so much better, especially when you're a kid. You, your focus is a lot higher. That's just one of my study tricks when I'm teaching kids, right? So let's figure out all the different ways. Let's look at each paragraph and see what they said. Well, this one's easy. Geologists, right? They can get information from geologists um, who study things like soil and rocks. So they can look at... Um, they can determine rocks. You know, a geologist can tell you how old a rock is. And you can probably figure out how old something is if it's buried in that rock, right? That makes sense. All right. Layers of rock. Remember, we talked about if something's lower, it's older. So let's say layers like a cake, right? The bottom would be older than the top. You put the icing on last, right? Uh, what else do we have? Radioactive dating, remember? Radioactive. You know what active means? That means moving around, right? Radioactive dating. So if something's radioactive, that means that there's radiation. It's active. It's still going. And there is also DNA. So we answer our question. How are ancient remains dated? They could look at the rocks around it. They could look at the layers of the earth. They can use radioactive dating. And they can do um, DNA testing on what they found if it's something that was alive. Got it? Any questions? Awesome. Now you know what to put if that question comes up on your test, right? There are four things. Don't forget them. All right. Why do scientists look for artifacts? That's another question. Let's figure out why would we want to know this, right? Let's see. Human ancestors called hominins lived millions of years ago. To study prehistoric people who lived more recently, like us, archaeologists look for old settlements such as villages or campsites. Okay, maybe uh, prehistoric people, right? We're not prehistoric. We can, we're reading history right now. So prehistoric people who lived more recently, they look for old settlements such as villages or campsites. Such sites often lie buried beneath layers of soil. So it's so old, the dirt's been covering it up over the years, the wind's been blowing over it. So archaeologists have to dig in the dirt to try to find these old villages and campsites. That didn't answer our question though, did it? Let's look through a little bit more. Archaeologists must carefully excavate or uncover these sites to learn about the people who once lived there. So the archaeologists are the one uncovering the villages and campsites from underground. As archaeologists dig up a site, they look for artifacts such as tools, pottery, or weapons. Remember, artifacts are anything made and used by humans. That's important. Remember, that's different from a fossil. These scientists then try to identify patterns examining what artifacts are found together in the same spot. Artifacts found in an ancient campsite 
can help archaeologists understand how the people who once camped there hunted for food and what they ate. So let's look at this paragraph again, right? Hmm. They look for artifacts, tools, pottery, and weapons. Now, why do you think when they're digging up these old campsites that they find things like tools, pottery, and weapons? Think about things that you find in the ground. Are these soft or hard? Exactly. A tool, like a hammer, would be hard. Pottery, you know, pots and pans, and things like that are hard. And weapons, you know, bows and arrows, knives, those are all hard. So when they're digging, they're looking for things that are hard. Artifacts, we should say, that are hard. So then they try to figure out patterns. Examining what artifacts are found together in the same spot. You know, if you find a bunch of weapons in one spot, what do you think that is? Right, it could have been like a battle. It could have been a place where they made the weapons. What if they find a bunch of pottery? What do you think? Yeah, they could have made it. It also could have been like a storehouse. Maybe they kept all their food in those pots. That was like their pantry, maybe. So they try to find patterns in what they find. If things are all found in the same spot, they can maybe make some guesses. Let's see. Artifacts found in an ancient campsite can help archaeologists understand how the people who once camped there hunted for food and what they ate. Now let's think about that, right? So let's say they find a, fun, a bunch of like arrowheads because, you know, you can't really find bows and arrows because wood can be pretty soft. Wood doesn't really last long in the ground. So they just find the arrowheads. They're obviously not hunting elephants with the arrowheads, right? They're probably hunting things like rabbits, squirrels, like little things that go fast that they need to shoot an arrow with. If they found spears, right, spear tips, then maybe they were hunting lions or what else? Buffalo, sure. Um, big things. So they could figure out how they hunted for food and what they ate. So if they've just found like spoons, maybe that means they're eating soup, you know. Um, they find cups, they can figure out, oh, you know, they were, they made cups, they were probably drinking water, maybe some milk, probably, who knows, you know. So these artifacts can find out a lot of things based on just like where they were and what they were and what was together. So that's a good reason, that's a good answer to our question. Why do scientists look for artifacts? Because artifacts can help us learn all these different things, right? Isn't that interesting? What do you think if they came across your room? <laughs> what do you think they could think about you? Hmm. You like video games, yeah, because you know, your Nintendo Switch is hard. So they'd find your, your Joy-Cons and be like, oh, they must have played video games here, right? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Same kind of deal, except it was before Nintendo's. Where did human ancestors live? I love where questions, because you know I love geography, but where questions are easy answers. It's easy to memorize, like almost one word answers, and easy, to, that's just the best kind of questions. A where question, bingo. When is a little harder, but where questions are the best. So where did human ancestors live? Let's find out. Where did human ancestors first appear on Earth? For a long time, scientists could not agree on an answer. Isn't that so strange to think about? Where did the first humans live? Hmm. I mean, that's our question, right? But have you ever thought about that before? Like, where did humans start? When did this all begin? Hmm. So they couldn't agree on an answer. They couldn't figure it out. Then, in 1960, British archaeologists Mary and Louis Leakey discovered a piece of a human-like skull at Olduvai Gorge in East Africa. The Leakeys called their find Homo habilis, or Handy Man, because evidence showed that these early human ancestors made and used tools. Tests showed that the Homo habilis fossils were at least 1.75 million years old. Think about that. Wow. From that point on, the search for the origins of humankind 
has largely focused on Africa. Let's look at this paragraph, right? We're talking about evidence here, right? So these people found evidence, some proof that early humans lived in Africa. And what was their evidence? Yeah, a skull, right? And not just any skull, a human-like skull. So it wasn't a human, but it looked like one. It wasn't a, a human skull, it was a homo habilis skull. And they called him Handyman because they figured out that these people made tools. And how do you think they figured that out? Yeah, they found it, right? Because for artifacts, you look for tools. So where they found these bones, they found tools. They looked at the evidence and they could conclude that the Homo habilis made the tools. Probably because they're th around the same age, right? That makes a lot of sense. Does this paragraph make sense to you? Do you think we answered the question? Let's write that down. Because remember, where questions are the easiest ones. Where did, what was the question? Human ancestors live? The answer was Africa. Boom. Got it, right? There's a little map over here. I wonder if we'll look at it later. That shows you just where in Africa it was. But I'm sure on your test you just have to put Africa. Let's find out if we need more details. It says African Beginnings. On November 30th, 1974, American anthropologist, remember that word? American anthropologist Donald Johansson made a discovery that helped shape how scientists view early human history. For three years, Johansson had been searching for evidence of human ancestors in Ethiopia, a country in East Africa, right? So he's in Africa in a country called Ethiopia, and he was looking for three years trying to find something. Let's see what he found. So he later said, on this November morning, it was about noon, I was heading back to my Land Rover to drive back to camp. And I happened to look over my right shoulder, and as I did so, I saw a fragment of a bone, which I recognized as coming from the elbow region of a skeleton. There is a piece of a leg, there is a piece of a pelvis, there was a piece of a jaw, there is a piece of a skull, and I realized almost instantaneously that we had part of a skeleton. Ta-da, he just found it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Just by accident, it seems, too. see what's on the next page. It's pretty self-explanatory. After two weeks of careful searching, Johansson and his team had uncovered hundreds of pieces of bone. What does that tell you? There's probably more than one person there. They decided that all the bones belonged to, oh, never mind, one individual, because they did not find two examples of any one type of bone. Uh, looking at the evidence, right? Proved me wrong. It was just one person. They determined that she was a 3.5 foot tall female. Johansson named her Lucy after a song by the Beatles, one of my favorite bands. Um, how did they know it was female and how did they know how tall she was? Well, if you put all the bones together, you can kind of figure out how tall someone is, right? Just based on your hard parts, you can see how tall you are, but female bones are different from male bones, so they can look at the right kinds of female bones and figure out, uh, you know, if there was a female or a male. I know, isn't that weird? <laughs> Johansson's team found some 40% of Lucy's skeleton. The bones of her legs, pelvis, that's her hips, ankle, and spine, that's her back, suggest that like us, she walked upright on two legs. However, she lived 3.2 million years ago. Isn't that, that's so cool. Makes sense. Awesome. Yeah, she walked upright. That means she's on two feet. Unlike, think like a gorilla that walks on like his hands and, you know, his feet or anything like that. Since then, 
Even older fossils have been found in Africa. In 1992, American anthropologist Tim White found remains of hominins who lived in Ethiopia. Remember, that's in Africa. At least 4.4 million years ago. I mean, even older than Lucy, right? Beginning with a single tooth, White's team uncovered more fragments or pieces of bone. Finally, in 2009, White unveiled a nearly complete skeleton of a female that he named Artie, more than a million years older than Lucy. Can you believe that? A million years older. Artie was taller and heavier. She probably walked upright, but slowly and awkwardly. Hmm. I think we should write that word down, Ethiopia. Let's say Africa, and more specifically, Ethiopia. We'll look at a map later and find Ethiopia. Let's finish the book. What's next? What is the oldest one? Ooh, that's a question, right? Let's find out who is the oldest. Many scientists believe that the oldest human beings to develop or evolve from their great ape cousins about five to seven million years ago. This process is what's known as evolution just like a Pokemon, right? Discoveries such as Lucy and Artie have also led most scientists to conclude that humankind began in East Africa around 4.5 million years ago. Should we update that in our notes? East Africa. Don't worry, we can always rewrite it. East Africa. Rewriting your notes is a good way to help you study too. See what else we have. 4.5 million years ago. Wow. French scientist Michel Brunet is one of a group of scientists that believes that human life started elsewhere in Africa. Ooh. In 2001, Brunet found a human-like skull in the country of Chad. Tests showed the skull to be nearly 7 million years old. That makes it, says Brunet, the oldest one. Let's, I mean, that's the answer to our question, right? But let's finish this section, see if there's anything else we can add to our notes. Brunei's discoveries raised questions. Chad is in Central Africa, not East Africa. Did humankind begin there rather than in East Africa? The skull Brunei found is older than other human fossils discovered so far. Is humankind older than scientists once thought? Hmm. Who knows? We'll have to look more at the bones, right? To find out. Scientists will continue to look for answers to questions like these. Meanwhile, the search continues. This is the beginning of the story, says Brunei of his work on Chad. Just the beginning. Let's add that to our notes. So human ancestors also lived in, we've got East Africa, we can put, and Central Africa in Chad. And we can also say this is the oldest one, right? So you have a question on your test, who is the oldest one? You could say the one found in Chad in Central Africa. Africa is still the key word here, right, for our where question. All right. Where did hunter-gatherers live? Remember, we were talking about hunter-gatherers in the vocab section. Someone who hunts and gathers. Early humans were hunter-gatherers, which means that they lived by hunting small animals and gathering plants. They also probably scavenged for food left by predators. They formed societies and developed ways to improve their chances for survival. So scavenged means, like, say, like a lion took down a deer, right? And the lion's not going to eat the whole deer, so maybe a hunter-gatherer went and took what was left. That's called scavenging. And then they formed societies, right? Because everyone needs to eat. And if you have more people around you to gather more food, then you can eat more. So people came together, and they figured out ways 
to improve their chances of survival. So, you know, maybe there's someone in their group who's really good at making knives. Maybe there's someone who's really good at cooking. Maybe there's someone who's really good at making clothes. So when they form societies like that, they're big groups together, they could live longer and maybe even live happier, you know? Let's learn some more. Archaeologists know very little about how early hunter-gatherers such as Lucy lived, but they do know that their lives were often harsh. Many groups appeared for a time and died out. To survive and grow, early humans developed technology, tools, and skills to meet their needs. So, based on what we know, we don't know much, but we know that they had a pretty hard life, right? And a lot of people died out. You know, their groups weren't strong enough to survive for very long. So they had to develop technology, you know, make better ways to build fires, so to say, tools, make better knives, and you know, maybe even light cups, things like that, and skills, learn how to hunt better, how to cook better, all those kinds of things. So if you didn't have those, your society wouldn't live very long. How were the first tools made? We've got another question. Let's figure that out. So how do you think? How were the first tools made. Hmm. Maybe out of rocks. That's a good point. Wood. Sure. Let's find out. It says about 2.5 million years ago, early humans learned how to make tools out of stone. You're right. This technology was so important to human survival that archaeologists call this period the Paleolithic Era, or the Old Stone Age. The Paleolithic Era ended about 2,500 to 10,000 years ago. So we know they're made of stone. Let's figure out the how. How questions are the worst, because you just have to write a bunch of sentences. Let's see. Over time, tool makers become more skillful, making thinner and sharper stone blades. Some blades were used to tip spears and arrows. Tool makers also began making weapons from bones and antlers. As their skills and weapons improved, Paleolithic, remember Stone Age, hunters were able to turn from hunting small animals to hunting larger animals such as deer. Hmm, isn't that interesting? So over time they learned how to make their weapons better and then they could hunt better things, right? So how are, oops, <laughs> how are the first tools made? Well, we know they were made of stone and they were made, um, as blades, right? Stone blades, spears, arrows, very first tools ever only tools in the toolkit, right? And they were made using new technology. I know that's a good word, technology. Which just means how things change over time to become better, right? It doesn't necessarily mean like Teslas and all that. So they became more skillful, improved their technology to make all these stone tools. How did fire affect human development? That means how people lived and how they changed for the better, right? How did fire affect human development? Let's take this. Let's just write fire, because that's kind of a long sentence. Fire. <laughs> Around 800,000 years ago, people also learned how to use fire. With fire, People could have light on dark nights, cook meat and plants, and use flames to aid in hunting and to scare off dangerous animals. Making fire also had important long-term effects, such as enabling people to live in places where it otherwise would have been too cold for people to survive. Hmm. So there's a lot to unpack here in this paragraph. That's a big how answer, right? How answers are long. So they could have light, they could cook, 
it would scare off animals and it could keep them warm and so they could move to new places if it's cold they can just build a fire so that's kind of a lot to write down we'll figure that out later that's probably like an essay question on your test those are the worst but it's pretty self-explanatory right it would be the same reason if you were having a fire in a campground you would cook marshmallows it would keep you warm it would keep any big animals away things like that a little bit more left. It says here, a British archaeologist explains why learning to control fire was an important step in human development. The control of fire was presumably the first great step in man's freedom from the bondage of his environment. Very fancy. Mankind is no longer restricted in his movement to a limited range of climates, and his activities need not be entirely determined by the sun's light. But in mastery of fire, man was controlling a mighty physical force. So fancy. So he's saying that he's not tied to what the environment provides them. They um, could go to different climates. They could go to places that were colder. And it's not determined by the sun's light. That's a fancy way of saying they could do stuff at night in the dark. <laughs> That's a fancy way of saying that. What was life like for hunter-gatherers? think about that. Culture. Remember we talked about culture. Culture includes the many different elements that make up the way of life of a people. These include social and family organization, beliefs and values, technology, shelter and clothing, common activities, storytelling, rituals, and art. So remember, culture is basically how you live your life um, in like accordance to how the people around you live your life. It's how your family is set up, what you believe in, what you value, how your technology is, what your house is like, what your clothes are like, what you do for fun or for work or for learning, how you tell stories, how you have holidays, and what kind of art you make. There's lots of things a part of a culture. Stone Age hunter-gatherers lived in small groups or bands. After gathering as much food as they could in one area, they moved on. They built temporary huts out of branches or made tents of animal skins. Bands stayed small so they could move easily. A typical band included 10 or 12 adults and their children. That kind of answers our question, doesn't it? What was life like? They lived in small bands. Um, they moved on when the food was gone to find more food. They built temporary huts. That means huts that aren't there permanently. They can take it down and move it. And they, they stayed small because if you have too many people, it's hard to travel. It's hard to coordinate all those people. Men generally did the hunting, but they also gathered other food. Women usually gathered fruit, grains, seeds, nuts, eggs, and honey. They caught small animals and may have picked herbs for medicine. Isn't that interesting? Men hunted, and the women usually gathered. Grains, like wheat, even corn, things like that. They caught and may have picked herbs for medicine, so plants that would make them feel better when they're sick, essentially. Like stuff that tea's made out of. Make sense? That was kind of an easy question, wasn't it? Another kind of self-explanatory one, one that if you just think about it for a second, you know the answer. I don't think we need to write that down, right? So let's look at what might be on the test. Let's look at our notes and see. So this chapter talked about um, how things are dated, and then it talked about how people used to live, where they lived, how they made their tools, how they lived their lives, how they built fire. Remember, that was an important part. Fire really changed a lot of things for them, didn't it? Yeah, and don't forget about archaeologists, anthropologists, things like that. The difference between a fossil and an artifact. You probably don't have to know that for your test, but it's good to know going on in history. So that's basically what we talked about in this chapter, right? Do you have any other questions? Remember the oldest one? Where did they live? Africa. You got it. Great job. I think you've got it, right?
Okay. Well, if you have any other questions anytime, just shoot me a text. I'll answer it. Don't worry about it. It could be late at night, early in the morning. I'll answer it for you. It's okay. And you're going to do awesome on your test. Don't worry about it. Because if you do bad, there's another test, right? You'll just do better on that one. You're going to kill it. I know it. Great job. Okay. And that's how I tutor. What do you think? For me, I developed the system when I was in high school, just breaking down each paragraph and figuring out what it's trying to say and writing down anything that's important. I would ace all my tests. And then, you know, with little kids, it's easier um, just to simplify everything. They really retain it and then they can start spitting out facts back at you. It's really cool. So if you liked this video, we can do more chapters, do some more study prep, and test prep. And yeah, that's a little window into how I would tutor kids. It was so much fun. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. I do hope you found this video relaxing and maybe a little educational. Who knows? And I hope you have a very good, 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 good,